the second season. To an anime fan, those are the most magical and coveted words they long to hear. A second season means more of the anime they like, more chances to see the characters they love, more time to see their stories play out, and frankly, more anime they get to enjoy without having to take chances on newer, unfamiliar titles. Back in the day, the seasonal model for anime was a rare occurrence. Most of the time, an anime with a source material of incredible length would just become a long runner, while successful original shows would get its sequels in the form of other standalone series like the Gundam franchise. But around the aughts, the seasonal model of anime really began to gain traction, and that's only just recently become the norm thanks to factors like the emergence of the streaming model and anime becoming more international. Nowadays, it's almost expected that an anime of at least some renown gets a token season. However, these things do have a weird way of working out. Even with hugely popular anime, a second season is not always guaranteed. It could take years for a follow-up to enter production, either due to other projects taking precedence or seeing if the franchise still has theoretical legs. It's the industry at work. Some shows get second seasons when they probably shouldn't have, some shows are still waiting for their second season that they totally should have by now, and some don't even have a snowball's chance in hell on getting a second season, even if they end on a cliffhanger and are left forever incomplete. But even if you are one of the hapless bunch who are still waiting with bated breath for your favorite anime to get its mythical second season, you should also be aware that a second season can be a roll of the dice. Especially with how second seasons can come years after production wrapped on the first season, a lot can change in that time. Staff can turn over, budgets can be cut, entire productions can switch studios, what qualities that made the first season so well regarded might not be present come the next season. Bad second seasons have been the death knell to many an anime's lasting legacy. It's a gruesome fate that has befallen once promising titles like All Noah Zero, Tokyo Ghoul, and most recently, the Promised Neverland. But those are just the worst case scenarios. There's also the chance that the second season can just be painfully mediocre. The story isn't bad, the characters still act in character, the animation hasn't gone down in quality too drastically, but there's something missing. The best example that comes to mind is what happened to the Food Wars anime after the first season. It didn't deviate from the source material, and that's all it had going for it. A lot of the snappy comedy, detailed animation, inspired storyboarding, and fan service were either gone or used more sparsely after the first season, with the anime becoming a more by-the-numbers adaptation that lacked any sort of, part of the expression, spice. The point I'm making is that, while a middling second season of your favorite anime might sound preferable to getting an infamously bad season of your favorite anime, it doesn't make the disappointment any less potent. Which brings me to Comic Party. At first glance, Comic Party does not seem like anything special. Just your average, everyday 13 episode visual novel adaptation done up in that primitive digipaint style that sets it squarely in the year 2001. But to me, it's a true comfort show. What seems like an average dating sim adaptation is actually a lighthearted slice of life about the trials and tribulations of being a creator, learning and perfecting their craft. The craft here being Dojin fan comics. All of which is dressed up nicely with a full cast of cute girls with their own set of quirky personalities and creative passions that round them out as characters. Oh, and um, Taishi. The appointed place, and the appointed time is here and now. Where are you going? Don't run from fate. But Comic Party has never really endeared itself in the minds and hearts of otaku over the years. However, I don't mind. It makes the love I have for it feel all the more special. And yet, once upon a time, the Comic Party franchise was popular. The game was popular enough to get both an anime and a manga spin-off. In turn, those two were popular enough that the anime got a second season. A joyous celebration of individuals who have staked their entire youths on Dojinshi! 
I'm speaking of Comic Party! I technically discovered that both Comic Party and its sequel series Comic Party Revolution existed at the same time. Mostly my interest was on Comic Party because A, I always watched the first installment before moving on to the sequels, and B, I could feel the reception from those that did watch Revolution was a little lukewarm to frosty. But after liking Comic Party, I decided that maybe I should check out Revolution. It can't be that terrible, right? The fact that I bought the entire DVD box set brand new for $10 at the Funimation booth was because it was a bargain, right? You'll be sorry! Okay, well, the question is, of course, is Comic Party Revolution good? The answer is no. Does that mean it's bad? The answer to that question is also no. This is what I mean by the follow-up to an anime you like being mediocre is just as bad as the follow-up being wholesale bad. The pain and dread of that journey is instead replaced by the emotion of frustration. Yes, frustrating is exactly the word I would use to describe a Comic Party Revolution. It shows knowledge of how to use these characters and their setting, but ultimately it uses them in such a way that the final result is underwhelming and everyone feels underutilized. It's an anime that never reaches its full potential on all fronts, whether that be visuals, character, or humor. Now take a good look, my sister. <laughs> and just like with the original Comic Party, on the surface, this also looks like just another slice of life comedy anime from the aughts. But trust me when I say that this anime is far more exasperating to deal with than it lets on, especially if you are a fan of the original show like I am. Ever since I made that original Comic Party video way back in the day, I've also been wanting to cover this one because there's nothing more satisfying than putting your own personal gripes about an anime into a video format, and I'm sure the characters of this anime would feel the same about my creative endeavor. So the appointed place and the appointed time is here and now, Let's talk Comic Party Revolution. So in case you're new here and don't feel like pausing this video and watching the video I did for the original series back then, here's a brief recap about Comic Party to catch y'all up. Comic Party is an adaptation of the visual novel dating sim of the same name, with the main hook being that you, the player character Kazuki, are a rookie doujinshi artist, and your pursuit in making the best damn fan comics you can sell at conventions puts you in the eyesights of a whole gaggle of pretty goyles. They are as follows. Your tsundere childhood friend Mizuki Takase, an otaku-hating normie who is initially opposed to Kazuki's newfound hobby, but slowly grows to support it. Well, there you go. Very slowly. Yu Inigawa, the rough around the edges glasses girl from Osaka who teaches Kazuki the ins and outs of making doujin comics. Passionate feelings bring in customers! So even if it uses up all your energy, be passionate! Emi Oba, the hyperactive egotistical doujin artist and Yu's primary rival. Would somebody tell me what that dumb hot spring panda is doing here? So what are you doing here? Have you finished all your homework like you were supposed to? Oh, yeah. No problem at all! Ayahasabe, the quiet, timid artist who makes original doujin and is often neighbors with Kazuki in the artist alley. I'll take one, how much is it? Uh, it's 200 yen. Minami Makimura, the incredibly helpful convention organizer and MILF extraordinaire. Ah, uh, this tea is delicious. The chamomile tea here is great, isn't it? Chisa Tsukamoto, the bumbling cutesy moe blob who runs the printing shop where Kazuki gets his comics printed. Reiko Haga, the tomboyish cosplayer who loves fighting games and yaoi and is Kazuki's co-worker at his part-time job. Komipa's the largest doujinshi event in the country, and this was organized by Komipa's planning committee. That makes it the largest cosplay event in the country! And Ikumi Tachikawa, a sickly young girl who's a seemingly minor character but does play the important role of being Kazuki's first customer. This happens all the time. I'm okay, really. You're sure? <laughs> Honestly, I'll be just fine. Oh, and we can't forget Taishi Kuhonbutsu, the business side of Kazuki's doujin circle brothers too, and the one who roped them into the hobby in the first place. You don't get to date him, at least in not any official capacity. What's wrong? You seem to be in trouble, my brother and my sisters. Now I, Taishi Kuhonbutsu, secret master of fandom, will show you how to capture an otaku's heart. 
What kind of contraption did you build in my room? As for the anime itself, for a dating sim adaptation, the focus was less on the girls and more on the doujin comics and the creative process behind them. It not only went over how doujinshi was made and sold at conventions, but also stuff like keeping a schedule, work-life balance, funding your passion, marketing yourself as a creator, the whole nine yards. And the girls aren't just there to look pretty and be nerdy GF wankbaits. They are three-dimensional characters who, with the exception of Mizuki, all know way more about the world of doujinshi than Kazuki, and are able to give him helpful advice by talking about their own experiences in the field and why it is their hobby. Sales-wise, the Comic Party anime had a sales average of 4,541 copies per box that sold, which doesn't sound like much, but was actually considered a pretty good success, especially in 2001, which was considered to be a pretty slow year, all things considered, for anime. And with the continued success of the visual novel series and Sekihiko Inoue's manga series that dropped the very same year, Leaf's parent company, Aqua Plus, figured that they could keep this Comic Party bus a-truckin'. So, in 2003, they commissioned the small studio Chaos Project to create a four episode OVA series called Comic Party Revolution. This series ran between December 22nd, 2003 to November 26, 2004. And then some madman at Aquaplus came out and said, You know what? We already got four episodes on our hands. Why not commission nine more episodes from Chaos Project so we can have ourselves a 13 episode second season all ready for the spring 2005 season? And lo, Comic Party Revolution as we know it was born. What's interesting about Comic Party Revolution is how much is different from the last anime. One thing, it appears to be more in line with the original games. Kazuki, Mizuki, and Taishi are no longer third year high school students, but actual college students who are at least of drinking age. Reiko being an FGC member and Yaoi Fangirl is present when those traits were absent from the previous anime. <laughs> And this was a real shocker for me on first viewing, there has been some off-screen character development for Mizuki. It turns out, in between series, she's actually gained an appreciation for cosplay, specifically cosplaying as the main heroine of her favorite anime, Cardmaster Peach. She still hates otaku, but it's a reasonable amount of hatred. Kinda like the reasonable amount of hatred we all have for Star Wars fans. But of course, the biggest change is the addition of two new girls, idol singer Asahi Sakurai and Miko fighter Subaru Mikage. Asahi was an unlockable secret character in the original game, and she did appear in the original comic party in the role of a voiceless cameo. Her character is that she is a famous idol singer and voice actress for the aforementioned Cardmaster Peach. But that's really all a persona. Off the clock, she's just a mousy glasses wearing geek trying to enjoy her hobby without attracting too much attention. When I sing, I help my words reach out to people. I want my voice to communicate with everyone. It's my wish to be heard by as many fans as possible. Subaru, meanwhile, was a bonus character added to the game's Dreamcast ports. Like most of the cast, she's also a doujin creator, a notoriously bad one I should mention, and fills the role of being the resident tokusatsu fan of the bunch. She also fills a role that was absent from the original, the dumbass. Subaru, you know we don't allow fighting in the exhibition hall. You could argue that Emmy filled that role, but she was more of a ball of rage and ego than actual dumbass. Subaru, on the other hand, that head is as hollow as a chocolate Easter bunny. The devil of bad economy and the debt collecting demons are pecking on the frail maiden cheese out, and Subaru will never ever let them get away with this! Miss Subaru? She's worrying about you in her own special way. Oh, and there's also Ikumi's delinquent older brother Yuzo as an addition, but he doesn't appear as much. Out of universe, the big change I would like to highlight is not only did Comic Party Revolution change studios in between seasons, but they also changed localization companies for the stateside release. The original was licensed by Right Stuff's Nozomi Entertainment Division. Revolution, meanwhile, was licensed by ADV in 2006 as a part of them granting the Japanese company Sojits a 20% stake in their company so that they could acquire more anime licenses. This would end up turning out quite badly for them in retrospect, but that's a story for another day. Interestingly though, the dub actors for Revolution, despite being a completely different cast, appear to be channeling the performances that the New York-based cast of the original did. You don't normally see this level of commitment to dub consistency, especially for anime like these. Some do their job well enough. So comics weren't really an option for me. Even if I made a book, all I could do was sell it to my friends. Reading manga is fine on its own, but writing stories yourself makes the Dochinchi world even more fun. Why would I want to help with your stupid comic book? 
I was offering to help you study, fool! I do hate otaku. And to be honest, I don't understand cosplay much either. But one thing's for certain. I like Peach! Oh. Distributing and interacting with your customers are also important. Yes, the convention does not end until you go home. I am a free agent, my brother. And the signing bonus was a voucher for a free copy of Cat of Fish's new issue. <laughs> and others, like Tiffany Grant's You, actually do better than the original. Parody doesn't mean you just copy pictures from another artist. My books are different. They're drawn passionately from the soul. A homage to the original. Oh, boy. If you get a lecture from her, her dumbness will probably rub off on you. Which just goes to show you that we do need more anime girls with rough Bronx accents. Aw, oh, jeez, shut your pie hole, would ya? The only weird casting decision is that ADV, for whatever reason, couldn't get Jessica Calvello to reprise her role as Emmy, despite the timeline suggesting that she was working for ADV Productions around this time. Maybe this was because this dub was produced during her sabbatical from the industry after she threw out her voice on the Excel Saga dub voicing Excel. Which I think is exactly what happened since her replacement for Excel, Larissa Wolcott, is also her replacement for Emmy. Which she does a pretty surface full job, albeit turning in a much squeakier performance. These changes are not the reason Comic Party Revolution is subpar, however. It honestly feels like the natural progression from where the previous anime left off. Asahi and Subaru do get introduced in a forced, awkward manner, but they eventually settle into their grooves. So who knows? Maybe Revolution won't be bad. They got a couple of ideas that the audience can look forward to, right? I said up at the top that I find Comic Party Revolution to be a frustrating anime and that would not be possible if there weren't any good parts worth giving credit to. A point in its favor is that the digital coloring doesn't look as garish as it did in the original, possibly because it's 2005 and most of the industry has figured out digital animation at this point. Digital effects on the other hand, that's a whole nother bucket of fish. I also genuinely like the opening better than Comic Party Originals. The song itself is a cute little feel-good pop song, and I like all the animation and posing they do in introducing all the girls and their shared quirks and personalities. There really is no radical departures from the characters' personalities. They are still the same gaggle of comics drawing and consuming geeks. Well, Taishi's obnoxiousness is turned up significantly to the point where you wonder why Kazuki and Mizuki haven't kicked them to the curb already, but it's not that big of a deal breaker, I think. Across the land, one of the core hot spring activities is peeping! What kind of hot spring story would this be without peeping? <laughs> Revolution's real potential, however, is in its format. At its core, it's an episodic slice-of-life comedy focusing on the main cast interacting with each other and getting into hijinks as they prepare for the next convention of the month. That means we the audience are no longer constrained to seeing the world of Comic Party through the eyes of the self-insert protagonist, Kazuki. We now have permission to look at the inner lives of all the cast members and see what they do when they aren't dispensing homespun otaku wisdom at our protagonist. We see Emmy's inner life as a high school student and how, despite being one of the most popular doujin artists in Japan, is constantly in danger of flunking out due to bad grades. We see Minami off the clock and tossing back a few frosty cold ones with a co-worker. There's also an entire episode about the cast visiting the Hot Springs Hotel that Yu's family owns and she talks about how it's her dream to inherit it. There's there's so much you can do with these characters now that they are no longer constrained to just being the dating sim girls. Now they can actually interact with each other. A good example of this is the episode where Emmy ends up becoming genuine friends with Asahi. But because Asahi is the famous idol singer and Emmy is, well, Emmy, people assume the worst and Emmy has to tell them that her relationship with Asahi is sincere and not just a cheap marketing tactic. Giving each other copies of the doujinshi we make is a sign of our friendship. Our friendship? <laughs> Upon rewatch, I saw how much promise there was in this anime, and how much it frittered it all away. So 
So now we get to the main course of the video, explaining exactly how Comic Party Revolution fails to deliver on what it promises. That promise is a continuation on Comic Party, but with a much larger scope that isn't so much focused on Kazuki, but the whole cast. Each member of the cast getting their own episode that highlights them and their relationship with the other cast members. And it does kinda deliver on that conceit, but it also kinda doesn't. Okay, let me back up a bit. The critique I want to get out of the way is that the first four episodes are actually edited down versions of this OVA series that kicked off the new season in the first place. And in the process of shaving the runtime off these episodes so that they can make it to air, they end up cutting some scenes that probably shouldn't have been cut. Episode 2 is the most egregious example because they not only cut out an actually funny joke, but also the entire conclusion of the episode. The whole episode being that Emmy wants to go to the beach, so Kazuki offers to take her, but she's too embarrassed to be seen in her swimsuit. The whole episode is leading up to that punchline, and without it, the episode just stops. So what you're saying, Chaos Project, is that the ending was a non-essential scene that could be cut, but all the scenes where Emmy is talking to this... Penguin, Tuna Fish, Seaman, on her Dreamcast was too pivotal not to cut. And by the way, you don't want to know what I had to go through to get footage of the original OVAs. I fear the mid aughts anime is really starting to slip beneath the sands of time. But nitpicks. Even if those scenes were retained, they would not fix the crux of everything wrong with Comic Party Revolution. And that is, Comic Party Revolution has no idea what it wants to be. You thief! Come back here! Unhand that woman! What should be a simple premise ends up getting hobbled by there being no unified vision of what it should be at the end of the day. I can't tell if this was a result of differing visions from the staff or the higher-ups at Aqua Plus, but there seems to be some infighting going on during this revolution. The microcosm of this is the first episode of the series. Focusing on Aya trying to figure out how she can get more sales on her manga, it mostly focuses on each of the characters giving their own terrible advice for a wacky set of gags. So which outfit got your blood pumping? Well, I really liked- oh! That's not the point! But then it transitions to a heartfelt scene where Aya takes care of an overworked Kazuki while they both finish their manuscripts before the con. If I don't redraw it, I won't make the deadline. Please, uh, just uh, rest until your fever breaks. But uh, I... You need rest. Please lie down. And then it goes into the last act of the episode, which is devoted to Subaru fighting off a pair of creepy otaku who are creeping on Aya in a drawn-out Battle Shonen parody scene. Dragon Fang Whirlwind Comic Party Revolution wants to be both a heartfelt character study of the people working in the doujin hobby, while also being this off-the-wall screwball gag comedy swarming with anime parodies. And also, you should win things by watching! And in pursuit of this futile balancing act, neither visions come out on top. The character study aspect ends up being a mixed bag. Sometimes it can work like with the aforementioned Emmy Asahi episode, but for most of them, it doesn't really make the most of the characters they are given. Plot lines like Reiko wondering if she should compromise her principles about cosplaying just to win a contest, and Mizuki questioning her newfound cosplay hobby after getting sexually harassed, are good plot lines for their own standalone episodes, but they end up having to share a single episode and don't get fleshed out as much as they ought to, leading to both plot lines ending pretty early and having to pad out the runtime with yet another Battle Shonen parody. The spotlight is also not shared equally. Cheese's episode of focus is actually really more of Subaru's episode of focus, with her learning that working in a print shop is harder than it looks. Why don't we print all these flyers in full color with super gorgeous gold leaf? to give it some impact, you know? And then there's also the episodes that appear to be character-driven narratives, but are actually just thinly veiled setups for punchlines that land like absolute thuds. Oh, is this episode where Kazuki suspects you of having romantic feelings for him gonna end with a steamy confession after an intimate conversation in the Hot Springs? Nah, it was all just the lead-up to you asking Kazuki to be the Hot Springs mascot for the day. It's like friends never ended. This is a noble and adorable mascot 
like Miss Gabor. It's almost like it was made for you. You fit in that costume perfectly. This ties into Comic Party Revolution's failure at being a wacky bobacky comedy because a lot of the humor just falls flat for me. It seems like the jokes are trying to go for this gag a second parody comedy energy like Excel Saga or Nurse Witch Kamugi, but it lacks the energy of either. It might be because the gags as a whole clash with the grounded setting of the world of Comic Party, which causes them to feel forced. This is worsened by the anime really trying to make as much anime references as they can, but something tells me that some legal team got involved and the anime became scared to make direct parodies. So aside from some references to properties all owned by Aquaplus, Revolution opts for only the broadest of parodies, all involving fake anime titles. Our next contestant is Young Gash from Fighters Breaker 2! Operation complete! Though this doesn't stop the localization team from trying to add those references in, however wrong they may be. You like wedding, Peach, don't ya? Huh? Huh? And then there are the moments where the anime chooses to get self-referential, quick dialing up of the characters' personalities and brief moments of self-parody almost as a wink to the audience that they are aware that the girls are based on pre-existing archetypes. The character who gets this the most is Ikumi. In the original series, it's only mentioned that she's a sickly child and that spending most of her time in bed was how she got into reading manga. But now she has a cute little orphan's cough every time she speaks, and she makes her arrival into the series in the back of a goddamn ambulance. Every joke about her in this anime is such an eye roller. Just once, I wish that I could be a sickly heroine who causes the hero to be consumed with worry about her. That is not a compliment, you know. And I say again, it didn't have to be this way. Beneath all the ill-advised combination of half-baked character stories and unfunny broad slapstick that only exists to pad out the show, there are moments where they capture the spirit of the original anime and they do end up reaching the surface. The penultimate episode is like a bonus episode of the original Comic Party, where Kazuki, Aya, Mizuki, and Reiko are shadowing a group of manga publishers and end up learning about the life of being a professional manga author and how the sausage gets made there. It feels like where a true sequel series to the original Comic Party would have gone, raising the question of of, now that you're settled in with writing comics as a side gig, do you think you'll want to go professional? You must have thought that the man who reminded you of Taishi was Mr. Yuara. Uh, he wasn't? That was an editor named Mr. Kono. The younger man in there who was taking notes, that was Yuara. Well, what do you know? And to fully drive home my frustration with this series, this episode is sandwiched between a bad comedy episode and a bad character-driven narrative episode. The bad comedy episode is a horror riff about an alleged haunted manga that is so bad it gives other doujin creators writer's block, with the final punchline being that a manga that bad could have only been written by someone like Subaru. Therefore, I invited Subaru to be our guest author, the guest star in our doujin show. <laughs> I see, so that's how the poison doujin was revived, huh? Uh-huh. And don't forget the destructively bad tastes. And the bad character-driven episode is a story about Kazuki getting a prime spot against the wall in Comic Party's next dealer's room, and that pressure starts to get to him as he tries to make the best doujin he has ever made before. But for some reason, this ends up being Mizuki's story about how her negative thoughts end up manifesting into a representation of her own self who wishes to use Kazuki's current mental strain to lure him away from the doujin world. But the real Mizuki confronts her shadow self and tells her that she has grown to accept both Kazuki's otaku side as well as her newfound cosplay hobby and… huh, this is sounding awfully familiar. <laughs> And on that weird note, Comic Party Revolution comes to an end. Appropriately, it's an anime that grapples with its own crisis of identity. But unlike Mizuki, it did not end with closure. It instead ended up as a confused mess that wanted to be so many things and succeeded in being neither of them. Comic Party Revolution was not the success Aqua Plus had hoped for. The sales data for DVDs tells us that it only had 987 average sales that season, obviously spelling an unofficial end to the Comic Party franchise, since 2005 was also the year the manga ended publication. ADV had to pay $30,336 to license this anime, and I don't know if that was the deal of the century or they got profoundly ripped off. 
Comic Party Revolution is a poor note for the franchise to go out on. An anime that's so very close to recapturing what made the first season so profoundly watchable with some brand new twists to take it to that next level. Unfortunately, its constant struggle to maintain a consistent vision causes everything from the comedy to the characters to suffer needlessly. But hey, at least we still have Aquapaza. This is what I mean when I say that sometimes your favorite anime getting a mediocre continuation can be just as bad as getting a profoundly worse continuation. It is so near to being the anime you want it to be, and yet so very, very far. I wish you were better, Comic Party Revolution. I and the rest of the dozen or so Comic Party fans wish you were better. But all you will ever be is a reference point to anime franchises wasting their potential, and your reward is your own franchise being given the closing ceremonies. Comic Party is now closed. We look forward to seeing you all again next time. Sayonara! <laughs>